Welcome to the world of statistics, AP statistics. One of the first things we need to do is look at the various graphs we're going to use and get comfortable with them. If we have univariate data, meaning one variable like test scores or something like that, then we can display data with a histogram, a box plot, a stem plot, and something new to most of you called an ogive or cumulative frequency uh, distribution. We'll get to that later. Now that's if the data is quantitative, if it's numbers like test scores. If the data is categorical, like uh, what state were you born in, something like that, it's not a number, it's a state, it's a category, then we can use pie charts or we can use bar graphs. A lot of people say, what's the difference between a bar graph and a histogram? Typically, histograms with quantitative variable and variables and, and bar graphs are with uh, categorical variables. We'll talk more about that later. Now, this is univariate data, and this is all we're going to deal with in this first unit in STAT later. We're going to deal with bivariate data, which is two variables simultaneously. We've seen that before with scatter plots when, again, the data is quantitative. When the data is categorical, like uh, what state do you live in at a, at a conference and males and females, something like that, categorical data, we're going to display the data from combining those two variables, categorical variables, with a two-way table. Again, we'll get more to that later. This is what we're dealing with in this first unit. One of the simplest graphs you can make is a dot plot. We just want to take, for example, these test scores and put a dot for every score num along the number line. It becomes a very useful little graph that we're going to use later on doing statistics because we want a quick snapshot of what this distribution looks like. By the way, it's not easy to earn an A in this class. If you want an A, you either have to work hard or leave a large sum of money on my desk after school with a request to increase your grade. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I would never ask you to bribe me by leaving money on top of my desk. I would ask you instead to put it discreetly in an envelope and tuck it in the bottom drawer so nobody sees. As long as we're on the same page, we're fine. All right, so anyways, dot plot. Now, test scores, what if we added more test scores? Well, the dot plot would get more populated and it would look like that. Now, one of the things really, it may seem simple, but we have to realize that we can go from a dot plot to a histogram by simply saying, oh, for every dot, for every score in a certain interval, let's create a bar that's as high as that frequency is. So we have two scores between 60 and 64. So we make a bar on the, in the frequency distribution going up to two. We only add one score in here, two scores here, three scores here, etc. So we can make these histograms, and the height of the bar in the histogram tells us the frequency, the total number of scores that are in that interval. And by the way, uh, if an interval begins at 80 and you have a score that's exactly at 80, it goes in this interval right here, 80 and above not in the interval below, so keep that in mind. Okay, then we get this thing called a cumulative frequency distribution. And what happens is, this might be a set of test scores, and as soon as you get a score uh, show up, the lowest score, we start to gain some frequency. And the frequency builds until we've accounted for all the scores. That should make almost no sense to you the first time through. Let's look at this a little bit more carefully. For example, if we go back to this histogram that we just made of these 20 hypothetical test scores, we see that we have these different bars here. This one's six units high, meaning there's six scores between 80 and 84. Remember, a score of 85 starts here and goes through 89. So we have all these different frequencies. Now, what happens with a cumulative frequency distribution, an ogive, is you can see that the lowest score in our data set is somewhere at about 60. So we don't see uh, scores show up until we get to 60 or higher. Now what happens is we have two scores by the time we get to 65. So by the time we get to 65, we're at two scores. We pick up one more score by the time we get to 70. So by the time we get to 70, we have a total cumulative frequency of three. By the time we get to 75, we have two more scores. So at 75, we're up to five scores. So we have an ongoing cumulative frequency of how many scores that we're seeing. So these dots just keep getting higher and higher. By the time we get to 80, we have three more scores. So we have eight scores by the time we get to 80. So here's 50, 60, 70, 80. So by the time we get to 80, we're up to eight scores. 
So it's accumulating all the scores as it goes. And so then what happens is, once we get to the total, we've gotten, we, we made it to our 20th score, all 20 scores by the time we get to 95. So by the time we get to 95, we've gotten to the peak. And so what you're going to see is this thing go like that and then level off. So it's a cumulative total. It never drops back down. And so it's going to become a fairly important graph for us showing the cumulative total. This is just the frequencies uh, one interval at a time, but this is the accumulated total. Now, if you think about that, what that means is this. We can take an ogive and make it into a box plot. And I think most of us remember box plots. The median is right here, meaning that 50% of the scores are below the median. The first quartile, Q1, is here. So there's 25% of scores down here, 25% of scores in here, 25 here, and 25 here. So a box plot is a very useful graph. It's very popular in, in research and, and just business uh, data so that people can get a quick snapshot of what it looks like. So let's see how you would go from an ogive, otherwise known as a cumulative frequency distribution, that's this guy, ogive, or cumulative frequency distribution. How do we go from that to a box plot? Well, I'm glad you asked. All we have to do is look on the cumulative frequency. We had 20 scores in the class, so by the time we get to our 10th score, we can go across from here and say, okay, where do we hit the graph by the time we get to our 10th score? Well, it's right about there at about maybe 82 or something like that. So that's where this first, that's where the median is, because we have 10 of our 20 scores at or below that. So 50% of the scores are below, 50% are above. Well, how do we find the first quartile? Again, glad you asked. We want to find uh, where does 5 hit? Because by the time you get to the fifth score, that's 5 out of 20. That's 25% of the score. So that puts you at the first quartile. So where would that be? We, again, we try to go straight across and see where this hits. And it hits right about here. So that's where we put the first quartile. So that means we expect, we see about 25% of the scores below whatever this guy is right here. Well, there's 50, 60, 70, there's 80, so maybe this is at about 77. So we can say by the time we get to a test score of 77, we have seen 5 of the 20 scores below that, so about 25% of the scores are at or below 77. About 25% of the scores are in this region in here, between 77 and oh maybe 82 or something like that. Hey, where's the third quartile? Well, let's go find how far, how high does a test score have to get to before you have accumulated 75% of all the scores in your data set. Well, 75% of 20 is 15, so about what score do we hit where we have accumulated 15 scores going up to that point? Well, that comes right down to about there, so that's the upper quartile, that's the third quartile. So we expect to see about 25% of our scores in there, 25% in here, 25% down here. So that's at the third quartile with 75% of the scores below it. The last 25% of scores are up here. By the time we get to that score of, I can't remember what it was, like 97 or whatever, uh, we've seen 100% of our scores. So that's what a box plot means. It chops up the distribution, the data, into four groups, each having 25% in it. You'll see that this group is stretched out more, so it has more of a range. You have to cover a higher, a bigger range of scores in order to trap the lower 25% of the scores. That's going to be huge. You really want to understand the box plots. And this is an ogive, a cumulative frequency distribution. That's how you convert it into a box plot. All right, now, we can have side-by-side -side box plots. If we say this is class A and class B, they both took the same tests, and these are the scores. By putting them, in this case, vertically instead of horizontally, like the last one we saw, we can make some quick comparisons between these two classes. Notice this. Here's the 50th percentile, the median. So do you agree that the median is up here, pretty close to a score of 90? Well, if you compare that to this class over here, uh, you aren't even, um, you have less than 25% of the people in this class getting a score of 90 or above. The upper quartile is just short of 90. 
So you can see that this box plot is set higher uh, in the positive direction. So you can quickly see that in this distribution, the median here is much bigger than the median there. The two maximum values are about the same. The minimum values aren't that far apart. Uh, but you can see that the median is higher here, the upper quartile is higher in this one, the lower quartile is higher in this one. So you can make some quick comparisons between two different populations or two different samples by using side-by-side -side box plots. The other thing, IQR stands for the interquartile range. It's, uh, if you recall, we had 25% of our scores here and 25% of our scores here. The interquartile range is the distance between the third quartile and the first quartile. It's this amount right in here. So maybe this is about, I don't know, 92 or 93, and this is down at 80. So maybe this interquartile range is somewhere around 12 or 13. Why is the interquartile range so important? It's where we find the middle 50% of scores. We say, oh, within this range of about 12 on this test, uh, 12 points on this test, we're going to find the middle 50% of all the scores. So the interquartile range becomes really important to us. One of, the, one of the simple things is we want to be able to identify outliers. Let's suppose I'm in this, uh, in this class over here, and oh look, there I am. So that's my score down there. Am I an outlier? Well, we can test to see if this is far enough away to be an outlier by doing this. Take one and a half times the interquartile range and subtract it from the lower quartile. Any score that's beyond that is an outlier, just like any score that's at least one and a half interquartile ranges above the third quartile would be an outlier. So if I'm down here at a score at 50, well, if the interquartile range is 12, we take 12 and we multiply it by 1.5, that would give us 18 points. So if we go to the first quartile, which is sitting here at about 80, and we subtract, 18 points from that, that takes us down to 62. So any score below a 62 would be an outlier, and on a modified box plot, that's why you might see a point or two down here insinuating that those are outliers. They're at least one and a half in their quartile ranges away from either the first quartile or the third quartile. These are stem plots. Most of you have seen a stem plot before. If these again are test scores, then this score right here would be a 93. My tests, I usually make them out of a thousand points, so I would put a key at the bottom of my stem plot to signify that a nine here and a three there combines to give you 930 points out of a thousand. So look for the key down at the bottom. If these are weights of gnats, it might be that uh, nine three is point zero zero nine three gra uh, milligrams or something like that. So important to look at the key at the bottom, but we get a quick picture again of the distribution, and we can more easily find medians and first quartiles and things like that after the data is arranged in order. Now we can compare two different classes by doing a back-to-back -back stem plot. So this could be one class's set of scores. This could be another class, and again, you can see quickly that there's more scores in the higher realm down here, more A's down here, as opposed to this class. We'll be making other comparisons later as we get further into uh, statistics. We can do a split stem plot. So in this case, if you see that there's two sixes, these might be out of 100 points. So maybe a six slash five is equal to a score of 65 out of 100. Well, uh, any score, that ranges from 60 to 64. The zero through fours will go in this stem, and the five through nines will go in this stem. That's why it's called a split stem. So we can have five of the 10 scores in the 60 range here, and another five, the 65, 66, 67, 68, 69. Those other five out of the 10 possible scores there in the 60s range can go here. 70 through 74, 75 through 79, 80 through 84, 85 through 89. A split stem is sometimes more desirable because it gives us more information. If you do a stem plot and you only have three stems, not desirable. You want to split the stems to get more accuracy and get a better feel for, for what this looks like. And you can see the nerd. Here he is, first time here, you're seeing the nerd. But he's saying, hey look, this looks like it has a bell shape. And sure enough, we're going to be discussing that throughout the year, that uh, anytime we see a distribution 
that has kind of a bell shape to it, we're going to make a note of that. Now, don't call it a normal distribution. A normal distribution, we'll learn later, and it is bell shaped, but it has other characteristics. So please start now being in the habit of just saying it's bell shaped. Don't assume it's normal. Uh, which is a specific type of a bell-shaped distribution until we've studied that well enough to be able to discern whether a distribution is truly normal or not, but bell-shaped. Uh, okay, now we can have discrete quantitative variables versus continuous. If we're looking at test scores, then we can get an 87 or an 88. Let's assume we're not going to get an 87.1 or something like that. So we would have a histogram, and these would be discrete values that you could take on. But if we look, let's say, of exact weights of students in a class, let's suppose, and the weights, somebody could weigh like 148.233 pounds. So now there's infinitely many weights that you could have in here. Therefore, it's referred to as a continuous random variable. So this cascade, this is actually a second grade class here. This is pretty, we have an obesity problem here in America, folks. And we need, anyway, so that's, uh, that's the exact weights. Here we go. So we're looking at this. We've got... Uh, again, univariate data, bivariate data, quantitative and categorical, and so we want to make sure we know when we're going to use each of these types of graphs. These are the ones that we just looked at here along with the dot plot. Let's just quickly talk about these and we're good for this first unit. So if we had variables that were uh, not numerical, not quantitative, but just categorical, let's suppose we say, hey, how many people in a class here or at a, in a university were born in North America or South America or somewhere else? And we could get frequencies for those guys. Well, these are not quantitative. This is not a one and a two and a three that wouldn't have any meaning for us. These are just categories of where a person was born. So again, it's appropriate to either make a bar graph or a circle graph, a pie chart to display the distribution there of a categorical variable. So we might see something that looks like a bar graph. These could be quiz scores, and this could be the person, a uh, place a person was born. Uh, over here, the quiz scores could range from six to 10, and we could take a mean average. This is quantitative data. So we could take a mean average and say, oh, you know what, the mean average looks to be, I don't know, about uh, 7.8 or something like that. So we could figure out a mean average from that. Now, if we took a mean average over here, it wouldn't make sense if you said, ah, Let's call this a one. Let's say this is a two, and you are a three. So if we took the mean average of this, maybe we get like a 1.3. What does that mean? On average, each one of us was born somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean? I think not. So when it comes to categorical data, uh, it's just, you don't, you don't take mean averages. You just want to display the frequencies. This is frequency. There might be like 78 people here. There might be 12 people here. There might be uh, seven people here or something like that. So it's just displaying frequencies of a categorical variable. That's displaying frequencies of a quantitative variable. So there you go. That's your initial look at graphing with regards to AP stat, the simplest and, and beginning uh, topics to start with, but we will progress from here.